use her video. Good morning. I'm Reverend Michelle Scott Huffman. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the minister at First Unitarian Universalist Church in Springfield, Missouri. Um, due to the blessings of technology, I'm with you this morning from a hotel room in Dallas, Texas, um, but excited to be here with you. I also want to thank Millie, our service leader today. Um, I think today might be her birthday, so thankful for us her giving our, us a part of her birthday. This morning, Millie shared with us some excerpts from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s mountaintop speech delivered on this day in 1968. Not knowing, of course, that his next 24 hours would be his last on this earth. He declared that whatever happened next, it would be okay. He knew that he had been to the mountaintop and he believed that the people would finish the work. When he closes his speech by saying, I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. He is expressing a deep faith in his own destiny and in the work that he had done and a deep faith in the commitment level of those who had come to join him in the movement. King is not talking here about the promised land as some heavenly afterlife where everything gets better in the sweet by and by. Rather, he is referring to a transformed world and particularly a transformed United States of America where racial, social, and economic justice finally prevail and the tools of nonviolent protests bring about lasting changes in policy and lived experience. Just shy of two years before this, in May of 1966, Dr. King delivered the Ware Lecture to the UUA General Assembly, a speech entitled Don't Sleep Through the Revolution, a title I deeply appreciated while writing this sermon, Awakening into Action. In the beginning of that speech, Dr. King said, there are those wonderful moments in life when you speak before a group that is so near and dear to you that you don't feel like you have to engage in the art of persuasion. You don't feel like you're in the midst of strangers. You know that you are with friends. I can assure you that I feel that way tonight. That being the case, I count us among those in whom Dr. King expressed faith on that night before he died. Some could say maybe just those of you who were alive at the time, but I tend to think that his expectation is meant for all of us as long as the work continues. And therefore all of us are grafted into a collective accountability to his miss mission and message. King believed in those who marched with him and those who invited him to address their crowds, to continue the work, and it was clear from some of his final words that he held tightly to the expectation that we wouldn't give up, that we would keep fighting, using the tools and strategies that he had helped to develop and continuing to build on those strategies with new learnings of our own. In his Ware lecture, Dr. King invoked the story of Rip Van Winkle, noting that most people remember from the story that the character slept for 20 years but that there is a more, important a more important point that often gets overlooked, which involves the sign on the inn in the little town where Rip headed off into the mountains for his 20 year nap. At his departure, the sign had a picture of King George III, and upon his return, the picture was of George Washington. Rip was rightfully confused and disoriented, King said, this incident reveals to us the most striking thing about the story of Rip Van Winkle is not merely that he slept 20 years, but that he slept through a revolution. While he was peacefully snoring up in the mountains, a revolution was taking place in the world that would alter the face of human history. Yet Rip knew nothing about it. He was asleep. One of the great misfortunes of history is that all too many individuals and institutions find themselves in a great period of change and yet fail to achieve the new attitudes and outlooks that the situation demands. There is nothing more tragic than to sleep through a revolution. While it is true that none of us can relate to having literally fallen asleep and slept through the American Revolution, 
I want to invite us to think today about other less obvious ways that we may have or may currently be sleeping through a revolution. Sleeping in our case is likely much more active and even conspicuously busy. Recently, students at Missouri State staged a protest with a sit out from the Multicultural Resource Center in order to call attention to the lack of adequate funding and meaningful policy change to enact true progress in diversity, equity, and inclusion. An unfortunate reality that has led to a revolving door or even empty offices of student affairs professionals in the positions that are most critical for supporting multicultural students. At the protest on that Monday morning, an Ecclesia student held a sign that simply said, at Cliff Smart, stop the performative action. Performative action, performative activism, and performative allyship are all related terms that refer to supporting a cause or issue to garner attention, support, or monetization from others, rather than actually caring about making a difference in the cause. We see this sometimes around pride events when every company has something with rainbows on it for people to buy. This behavior often aligns with the Good Samaritan ideal for some or the white savior complex. And parts of that definition were shared by Chelsea Candelario. It often carries with it a mostly unspoken attitude that the person doing the performing has done a favor for a marginalized person or group by spending their social capital to use their privilege and influence so boldly. In reality, though, as Carmen Morris writes in a November 2020 Forbes article, performative allyship has a disturbing influence which stifles progress and has the detrimental effect of suppressing attempts to foster genuinely inclusive environments. It renders illegitimate any attempts to change processes and support that support structural racism and other barriers and is disingenuous and potentially harmful to marginalized groups. I think performative allyship generally starts with good intentions, or at least intentions that aren't all bad. And likewise, the visible results can be a mixed bag, causing further confusion about the effects of our performative actions. Sometimes it's only in hindsight that we identify that a particular statement or action derived from motives that weren't fully pure or resulted in unexpected gain that set into motion a system of actions and rewards that get more and more performative over time. Some say that's what has happened with organizations that promote deep connections to King and other civil rights era activists, such as the Southern Poverty Law Center. Former staff member and prolific Southern politics writer Bob Moser writes in a 2019 article in the New Yorker after the sudden dismissal of SPLC co-founder Morris Dees. The Law Center had a way of turning idealists into cynics. In the decade or so before I'd arrived, the center's reputation as a beacon of justice had taken some hits from reporters who'd peered behind the facade. In 95, the Montgomery advisor had been a Pulitzer finalist for a series that documented, among other things, staffers' allegations of racial discrimination within the organization. In Harper's, Ken Silverstein had revealed that the center had accumulated an endowment topping $120 million while paying lavish salaries to its highest ranking staffers and spending far less than most nonprofit groups on the work that it claimed to do. The great Southern journalist John Edgerton, writing for the Progressive, had painted a damning portrait of Dees, the center's longtime mastermind, as a super salesman and master fundraiser who viewed civil rights work mainly as a marketing tool for bilking gullible Northern liberals. I know that there are people in the sound of my voice today who financially support the Southern Poverty Law Center, and I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't. I don't actually think that because an organization has money that they don't need more money to keep doing the work. I do think the ambitious, very modestly dressed organizer on the streets of DC who first convinced me to make a small donation to what I saw as this scrappy Justice League doing the work that pulled at my heartstrings was either a little dishonest or misguided himself. 
But frankly, I want the work that they are doing to be well-funded. They continue to take on hate and extremism and attacks on voting rights and argue for Im immigrant justice, criminal justice reform and LGBTQ rights. They offer important free resources to educators through their Learning for Justice program, formerly known as Teaching Tolerance. And they shine a light on unjust school funding formulas that almost guarantee that poor students and a majority of students of color receive fewer educational opportunities and perpetuate a system where a student's zip code serves as a fairly reliable predictor of educational outcomes. And yet, Moser goes on to say, these days, whenever I tell people in New York or DC that I used to work at the Southern Poverty Law Center, their eyes tend to light up. Oh, wow, what was that like, they'll ask. Sometimes, depending on my mood, I'll regale them with stories about the reporting I did there, exposing anti-immigration extremists on the Arizona border, tracking down a wave of anti-transgender hate crimes, writing a comprehensive history of the religious rights war on gays, but then considering whether to explain what an unsettling experience it could be, I'll add, it's complicated though, and try to change the subject. For those of us who've worked in the poverty palace, putting it all into perspective isn't easy, even to ourselves. As Moser indicates, the truth is, it's almost always complicated. The good that we do is often inextricably bound together with our missteps. Our intent is often overshadowed by the unintended impact of our actions. Good people make bad choices. And these realities can cause a form of fear-based paralysis that renders us actionless. And before you know it, we've been lulled into sleep, either acting performatively or not at all. And hopefully, before we've slept too long, out of the depths of our conviction, we hear MLK on that night in 1966 in the Ware Lecture saying to us Unitarian Universalists, there is nothing more tragic than to sleep through a revolution. Chelsea Candelario offers a series of action steps to help us wake up and get back to work. She says, first, listen to the oppressed groups with whom you claim to be in solidarity and follow their lead. Don't ask in ways that you think, don't act in ways that you, th don't, that you think will be helpful to them, but act in the ways that they ask you to. When you ask someone, how can I help? And they tell you how you can help, do that not what you think they need. Next, do your homework. The issues continue to develop over time and things change. To be good allies, we have to always be in a posture of learning. Be less concerned about educating others and more concerned with educating yourself. If you are doing that and acting accordingly, others will be educated in the process. Along this vein, Ask yourself why you're sharing something on social media. Is sharing that post the only thing you're doing about the injustice? Or are you actively doing something to work for the change you say you want? It is really easy to get swept into performative allyship on social media and even to judge others for their failure to perform accordingly. Then take action. Vote, lobby, donate, march, serve, confront, teach, etc. If you spend more time talking about what you do or did do or would do for a cause than actually doing those things, then it's time to awaken into action again. Our convictions will not bring about the change that our world desperately needs, but our actions will. I'll close with some important words from our chalice lighting today and focus our attention back to the fire that gathers us. The fire of love burning deep in every human heart calls us to awaken. Awaken to the work of justice. Awaken to the work of compassion. Awaken to the work of community. For in this time of human suffering and exaltation, we are called beyond awakening into action. 
May it be so. Blessed be. And amen.